I am going to get started, I think, because we've just gone nine now. So let's get started. I'm not sure if um, everyone in the room knows me. I know that ma the majority of you do. I'm Anita, I'm from the Business Exchange. We produce business magazines uh, for Bath and Somerset and Swindon and Wiltshire, complemented by online content. During the lockdown, we've been working really hard with our digital content, with our, our web, keeping the websites nice and busy. Um, we've upped our newsletter coverage from once a month in each of the areas that we cover to twice a month. Um, we've been re working really hard signposting um, to, to see, to ensure that we can help as many people as possible um, get the information that they need to help their business. Um, so in Wiltshire, we've been promoting the Swindon and Wiltshire Local Enterprise Partnership and the Growth Hub and its coronavirus support services. I think we've got Chris Stevens in the room this morning. Um, so we might introduce him a little bit later. Also the work of Swindon Council and Wiltshire Council and their promotion of the Sybil scheme and also uh, Business West's work with their trading through coronavirus service. There's been lots of help in those areas from those different um, people and organisations. Um, I can share with you post session the details of these different networks um, if you don't know them and would like to have some access to them. So in the room this morning we've got a real mixture of different people, we've got marketeers, we've got business advisors, recruiters, HR advisors, employment lawyers, events managers, SEO specialists, digital transformation specialists, uh, financial advisors and accountants, hoteliers, software designers, um, you name it, we've got a lot. Um, so there's lots of ways that we need to adapt uh, to actually lift off from lockdown and I don't think it's going to be so much of a, a quick lift off um, from everything that was announced on Sunday night. It's going to be a real slow, slow burn for us, but we all need to work together. We all need to support our local economy and how can we all work together to ensure that we can get back to business as quickly as possible. I put a little poll out there so that we can get a little bit of a gauge of what's going on in the room and um, we can, you can also ask questions throughout the session to our panellists. Um, I'm going to start the discussion this morning uh, by talking about PPE um, signage and rethinking the workplace. I think they're going to be big topics of discussion for us this week as so many firms are trying to get back to work tomorrow or, or next week. These things can't all happen overnight with so much work that needs to be done but what can we do and, um, and to, to get things back as quickly as possible. Um, first of all um, I'm going to talk about signage and I'm going to intro Dave Dixon um, and um, Dave, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing? Yeah, we've, um, we've, we've had a couple of guys in uh, a little bit longer than I started back. I got back to the office on Wednesday. Uh, Kieran here runs our large format department, so he's been making templates for social, social distancing signage. Um, we've already had some requests for floor graphics, wall graphics. Um, it's interesting, even, even being back in the office myself, Oh, I'm back. I'm back. Was it that boring? I need to, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but even being back in, in an office uh, with, with a couple of other people in, uh, we've got quite a large premises here. But just understanding how far two metres is, is is quite an interesting experience. So we, we've actually put markings around, around our workspace already. And I think as people start to trip back, into their workplaces and, and people start to work out how far away or, or not far away to meters. I think we're going to be um, we're, we're going to be quite busy. So we've had, in fact, not just retailers. Uh, we've actually had office uh, offices and people who work in offices contact us to, to, to help with that. So we create some templates which can be branded up however people like. Um, so I think we're going to be quite busy. 
on that front. Uh, and in fact, I've been, I've been chatting to one local shopping area, a uh, street, about potentially looking outdoor signage when people are queuing outside the shops, uh, something a little bit nicer than just Chevron tape, uh, which might have to be stay on that floor a lot longer. In terms of packages and things that you're doing, um, are there any particular deals that you're trying to promote? Are there any bulk deals that you could potentially get out there and support our local businesses with? Yeah, well, we're going to do two things. One, one uh, if, uh, if, if clients want to contact us and, and are happy for one of our people to work, keep to visit their workplace before their full of staff, uh, we're quite happy to send uh, our chap out there to kind of measure up and look at ideas for them. We're going to be putting some uh, generic stuff on our website shortly, but you can look, see a price for, say, a circular or, yeah, floor graphic, buy a number of those, however many they want, pick a colour. We've even come up with some different colours because we know we want to fit with people's workplaces. And it, I think it's going to be quite popular, and I think it's going to be really quite important if we keep driving for, for, for not just a couple of months. I think this is, you know, we all know this is going to be around for a very long time. Uh, we keep driving this, this distancing message. Uh, we, we're, we're interested in here, we, we have not, and we have a, what's your production environment as well. Uh, so it's, uh, for us it's been kind of marking out the floor, moving machines around to make sure they're further away. Um, even things like computers, a lot of offices have moved to kind of hot desk facilities. And I think uh, we're already hearing that, you know, hot desk is going to have to probably go out the window. People move, introduce light clients that are use the same workstation. Um, and there's going to be a lot of work there where, um, where, where people have to start operating differently, not using someone else's keyboard. So we're even looking at kind of little signs that might go on computer screens to remind people to either wipe down their keyboards, don't share phones, um, work from your own workstation. So I think there's going to be a lot of change in the workplace. Definitely. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to move on quite quickly to Richard Hoffman from Elm Workspace um, because Elm are doing a lot of work in that area. Let me put the spotlight on you, Richard. Richard, tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing. So, mainly based, good morning, everybody. Sorry, good morning, everybody. Um, mainly around our own offices to start with, because we've been trying to go back over the last week or so. Uh, and we've worked around our own offices, trying to, a bit like uh, your previous uh, talker uh, said, about looking at the space and how much space we actually need to have two metres apart. Uh, and you know how many people could we actually fit in our offices and actually keep social distancing you know working properly for us and the other things that we've looked at is I'm, I'm sure everybody's seen the adverts from different companies out there is you know, if we can install certain um, items of furniture these screens these perspex screens which are easily be white countable and cleanable that can actually separate people if they can't be exactly you know two meters apart um, the other things that we've looked at as a company is also saying okay out of how many people in the team can we still get people to work from home? Can we look at shift patterns? Just so we can keep the business operating um, you know, and provide a service to people out there. We've had a couple of customers come on to us as well and ask us to look at replanning their space. And it's usually over the last X amount of years I've been working with people to actually either get more desks into a space, but now it's actually saying, well, how, what's the safest amount of desks we can get in a space? Um, keeping the two meter you know, gap between us all. So that's how I've been sort of looking at things and helping out clients around that. And this week, are you returning to work? Are you back to it? We've got a small team back in at the moment. I think we've got four people in the office where we probably normally have 15 or 16. Um, and obviously, we're driven by demand, Anita. Uh, and if the demand's not out there, we're not going to rush people back to work. Um, you know, we're waiting for other customers to come back if we want our services and the products that we offer. So it's, it's going to be a slow crawl, I think. I think come June, uh, the beginning of June, when we do have a lot of pent up orders already re ready to go out, uh, then we'll probably look at upping the sort of quantity of people that are available uh, in our workplace. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to move on now to Catherine, um, who's going to, let me just put her in the spotlight, uh, talk to you a little bit about PPE and the work that she's been doing in the community. Hi, good morning everyone. Um, so I'm not a PPE expert, I just want to say that straight off, but what happened was we repurposed our factory in Bristol 
uh, to create or manufacture uh, visors for the NHS and that's how we started. Uh, we now manufacture those and we also supply other products because we got a demand, we had a demand and we just had to fulfill that demand. So we actually have supplies in stock of everything pretty much that you will need around PPE. We have masks, uh, we have hand sanitizers, we've got the visors which we manufacture ourselves and some of the other products which uh, both the guys have just mentioned uh, also. Um, just to give you an overview, just in case anyone doesn't know about masks, it's, it's a bit of a minefield actually. Um, we do have different types of masks. Um, is it okay if I just show some examples, Anita, here? Just Brilliant. to uh, yes. clear. So we have something here which is a KN95. Um, this is the most protective mask and one that's the, which is recommended for everyone to wear. It's actually medical grade and just in case you're wondering why we don't supply this to the NHS, this is actually their third, this is the lowest grade of medical mask. They do not really want these, they use them only in emergencies. We have supplied them to the NHS but now they have their own supplies. So we're able to transfer this supply now to, into the business community. So that's the KN95. We've got um, also spun, uh, washable uh, sponge masks here, which you can use and uh, you can sort of uh, wash them so that you can use them multiple times. They're not single use. And then we've also got boxes of disposable masks as well. So these are ones that you could perhaps give out to people uh, in the office. Um, they, you use them maybe for a day and then dispose of them. So these are the ones that you can give out to people who may be coming to the office, maybe if they don't work there or into your business environment. Okay, so we supply all of these types of things. We've got hand sanitizers made in the UK. Uh, it's 72% alcohol, uh, not advising anyone uh, <laughs> drinks it, but it's, it's very high, uh, uh, you know, strong uh, antibacterial um, liquid. And again, those can be left there. It's only a small bottle, so it can be left uh, on, on uh, you know, in different areas in the workspace and also can be given out individually to, to uh, people coming to your work environment. Thank you. Well, I think one of the, the main concerns is that we are all prepped and ready to go with this. I know I personally haven't got a mask and I need to get hold of one and some for the family as well. And you go on Amazon and you think you might be able to get hold of some and you can't get them. So to get them in numbers is going to be tough. Catherine, if people were interested in bulk orders or specific orders, would you be up for that? Absolutely, uh, absolutely, Anita. We we do bulk orders. We can supply bulk orders. Um, normally, it's uh, ten thousand items for a bulk order discount. Uh, I have to say that we've we have very very small markups on everything that we supply anyway. So you will probably find even if you look at other suppliers that we are, um, you know, our prices are very low. But yes, we can do bulk orders. What we found is that certain companies or groups of people have have clubbed together to put in one order to get the discount, which of course we're very happy to do that. Or we can order, you know, you can order online and um, get those sent out individually uh, to you. Great. Please, can I just say, Anita, please be careful, even if you don't buy from us, please can you be very careful who you do buy from? There's a lot of scams out there, and I know you and I spoke about this last week. I've had many people in tears on the phone to me because they've been scammed, including a care home that ordered £60,000 worth of PPE, which has never arrived. The website disappeared two days after they put the order in. So please, please be very careful who you order from. Thank you. That's frightening. How can people do such wicked things in the situation that we're in? Thank you. Right. Um, I'm going to move on now and we're going to talk about people a bit um, and things have moved on um, this morning. I'm going to introduce um, Kerry um, into the room and I'll just make sure that she's not on mute anymore. Morning. Good morning. Kerry um, is Head of Employment at Thrings Law and um, this morning Kerry we spoke last night and we talked a little bit about the furlough scheme and it seems that things have literally happened overnight with reports this morning that the furlough scheme may change um, and, and continue as we um, go on to the next few months. Have you read the news this morning? Um, yes, I think 
I mean, essentially, we're waiting to hear from Rishi Sunak later today, aren't we? Um, I think everybody had lobbied hard that it should end and everybody fall off a cliff at the end of June. Obviously, currently, it's lasting until the end of June. Anticipating probably that there might be changes, so there's something of a of a phasing out of the scheme, um, but to avoid those businesses that either are restricted even at the end of June from going back to work. So some of the hospitality, for example, um, and other businesses that are still suffering because it's going to be some time before they can get back up to full speed. So it's only sort of my guesstimate, but obviously a couple of things we might see is just a reduction in the amount of grants that employees can recover. Or alternatively, what some businesses are lobbying for is the ability to get people back part time, but still draw down some grants so that they've got that support for their payroll. Because obviously, building your business back up is equally going to take some time. But I can't really say any more than that. We're all waiting to hear later today. And what are the conversations that you're having with your clients at the moment? You've obviously moved on from the initial furlough scheme. Where are you now with the conversations? I think that's right. I mean, there's probably sort of three categories at the moment, I would say. There are those businesses where actually even given Sunday night's announcement and this um, new roadmap are being told, well, if your people can work from home, keep them at home. So those businesses, I think, are starting to look at, well, we all had that immediate response. We did everything we could, we could quickly to get people working from home. But if we've got to sustain that for some time, what more do we need to do to support our remote workforce? So there are those conversations. I think the second group are the people thinking about bringing people back from furlough. So either they haven't been open or they've been running on a skeleton crew and now they need more people because they can see things are opening up and business might pick up. And then you go into the realm of in the same way that when you put people on furlough, communication was really key, winning hearts and minds, getting your people behind you so they understood what you were doing and why, I think the same will apply to bringing people back. So talking to your staff about whether they are in any of the vulnerable groups, so either extremely vulnerable and shielding, or other vulnerable groups that are still advised to stay at home as much as possible, pregnant women, um, people over 70, people with other conditions, parents who are still gonna have childcare issues. So yes, schools are going to gradually reopen, but they're not all going to spring open overnight. So there are still some people for whom coming back right now might be quite difficult. Again, employers have got to go out to their workforces. They've got to weigh these things in the balance and just try and bring people with them in the fairest, clearly, way that they can. Um, some people would be very keen to get back to work. Some people will be quite nervous about it. So there's the whole psychological impact of people who've been sitting at home only seeing their family for a couple of months are going to be quite nervous going back into the workplace. So that's another sort of layer of things to think about, really. Thanks, Kerry. I'm just going to introduce Joe Kangas from Keystone HR into the conversation now. Morning, Joe. How good morning. Are you, good morning. <laughs> How are you finding it, Joe, out there? What are the conversations you're having? To be honest, very much similar to what Kerry said, um, a lot of talk following the guidance that was launched um, or issued by the government yesterday about bringing people back to work. So I've already had quite a lot of emails um, in the last 12, 24 hours about that. Um, and really around, you know, if people don't, don't feel comfortable coming back to work or they physically can't because of childcare, um, about having those conversations um, with them and being, just being open and honest and looking at um, being flexible, looking at alternatives for how to accommodate and support people back to work. Um, and the other conversations is really about how to keep those people who are working from home engaged. Um, I think a lot of people now, you know, we're in our eighth week and, you know, people are beginning to feel quite isolated. They're missing that social contact with their colleagues. Um, so it's coming up with initiatives and ideas of how to keep that social interaction going without it all just being completely work related. I think we'll move on a little bit to that later in the discussion. I've got some people in the room we can talk about well-being a bit, but I think that's really key for all of us at the moment. I feel like I'll get out of bed one day and I'll be really happy and raring to go. And then all of a sudden you hit a wall sometimes and you're like, okay, because I feel like 
every day is a little bit of a learning curve in adapting my business. A little bit like when I started out over seven years ago. We're on a journey. It's everything's changing news wise all the time and we're just having to adapt and I think that's really hard for us to all deal mentally with um, as business owners as well as trying to run families as well it's tough isn't it yeah definitely thank you Joe. well now I'm gonna move on and talk to Dan Barfoot and if I can find it where's his face there he is I'm putting him on the spotlight Morning, Dan. Morning, Anita. All right, can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. How are things with you in terms of recruitment? How have things changed? Um, I think, to be fair, we just, uh, we've slowed quite a lot. I think, um, I've just seen, to be fair, Amanda Franks, his name pop up, who I, who I know quite well. Um, but yeah, I think recruitment has just been going to be on the back burner of everyone for some time right now. Um, there were some stats out last week from our industry that say that uh, unemployment at the start of the year was 3%. It's now gone to 10%, uh, and they're now saying it might um, go uh, drop down to 8% over the yearly average. Because um, what we're sort of finding, um, we're sort of finding is there is still roles out there. Um, the top 10, the top, the top 10 job roles across the country last year, uh, last month were sort of healthcare and, and, and health sector. Um, but we will sort of see a knock on effect probably from September. Um, people will come back in. People will be like you say, like Kerry said on firm hour, we'll look at who's coming back in. Um, there will be some redundancies, but it all, a lot of our industry detects around people with kids. If they can't interview, they can't start a new role. Um, and people won't probably make look at making a permanent role change until probably September. Um, so I think a lot of people might think the candidate market will be full at the minute. It's not that full, I would say. It, Personally, if you're looking to recruit, um, I would say probably be around September time when you'll get a full gauge of who's in the market. And are you doing lots of video calls for interviews to, to engage with clients or, or um, talent? We, we've, done, we've done quite a few. What, what we're finding in our industry is a lot of clients, they're dealing in-house with their own stuff first. Obviously, they're going through their own processes, um, but we're keeping in touch with, with our staff. And like you say, we're offering um, some free interview advice because reality is this is how most people interview for the next or maybe up to next year really, won't we? It'll be across video and it's, it's getting people's confidence who don't normally communicate this way that obviously this will be the way that it, that it will be the preferred method for the ongoing future. Definitely. We're going to talk about tech a bit later and how we move on from there. But um, I, before that, we're going to talk about the property market. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to move on to Alison Williams from Carter Jonas. Now, um, Alison can tell us a little bit about what's going on in her world. Morning, Alison. Sorry, just unmuted myself there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, surprisingly, we're actually doing um, quite well in the um, in the property sector in terms of from an industrial point of view. Um, we've actually found that I mean, I've, I've been really amazed at how much business we've actually done in the last sort of six to seven weeks. Um, and that's really on the industrial side. Um, and it's really relating to, um, well, COVID relating a lot of the inquiries, but also those inquiries in the sort of like the five to um, 25,000 square foot size range. You know, it's, it's been amazing as how many that we've actually received. And I guess that's really because, I mean, my sector is mainly storage and distribution. Um, and that's a sector that's actually growing. I mean, obviously, in terms of offices and in terms of retail, um, that has had a massive impact, the COVID um, situation. Um, and I don't think that we're going to be um, returning um, or, or the market's going to return in those sectors for a little while. Um, I mean, it, it, it will happen in time, but it's as the other, um, the other participants on this call are saying, um, and people need to have confidence, they need to have confidence when they return to the office that they will be safe. Mm -hmm. And I think when these things are sort of, um, when that is actually addressed and signage is there and everyone really knows what the, uh, what the parameters are with which, with which they should work, um, I think the office sector will come back and I think the retail sector will probably follow, but I'm neither an expert on those, those sectors, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, I can only really speak for industrial. Um, and at the moment, that is, a, that is a sector that's actually holding up in terms of rents um, and in terms of probably capital values as well. Um, we do have a generally have a shortage of industrial space across the um, the region particularly in wiltshire we've had very little um industrial development over the last 10 years 
um, and I think that space that is freed up by way of some casualties of the crisis, um, I think will take, be taken up quite, quite quickly. Um, so that's a sort of an overview of the property market from an agent's perspective with a specialism in industrial. Thank you, Alison. I'm now going to move on to Lindsay Holdaway from HBH Commercial Property. Good morning, Lindsay. How are things for you at the moment? You've got interests uh, throughout the South West, haven't you, with Bath and Wiltshire being key parts of that? Yes, that's right. As a company, we're spread over um, a region around 60 miles, I guess, from, from Central Bath. Um, most of our holdings are probably in North and West Wiltshire and Swindon. Um, and we have tenants in um, warehousing, industrial, office, retail and hospitality sectors. Um, for us, the immediate impact uh, of the lockdown, um, given we were locked down on the 23rd of March, was the 25th of March, which was the rent quarter day. Um, and some sectors were affected more than others, um, and some businesses immediately lost their markets and had to close. Other businesses were able to carry on, um, and therefore we had a variety of uh, requests for support as the government support took three, four, five weeks to come through and some businesses needed immediate support otherwise they would have closed probably by the end of the following week. Um, so we have an ongoing uh, discussion with the majority of our tenants really um, as to how they can afford buildings that they can't necessarily properly use. Uh, as Alison said a lot of the industrial and warehouse buildings are, are in full use valuable use and those companies uh, are gaining value from those buildings and can pay for them um, but at the other end of the scale the chap who runs the pub can't see that business opening till July at the very earliest and probably later than that um, and therefore how can they afford to pay for a building that they can't use um, and so we've been talking to the Treasury and um, MHCLG about a potential rent furlough scheme um, which is what they've used in Denmark where the landlords, the, uh, the government and the, the tenant work out a business plan so that that business can move forward and not suffer the full impact of property cost. Um, and that may be something that will follow. It's disappointing that actually we have seen no mention of that so far. Um, all the talk is about really the current measures. But for us, the 24th of June, the next quarter day, will be the litmus test of how the economy is actually doing and how many businesses at that point feel they can actually afford to pay for the properties that they have. And then the second string for us is making sure people, now that there is a partial lifting of lockdown, can get value out of their buildings and can use them as best they can. And so we've been working for the last two weeks on developing unlocking plans for the multi let buildings and issuing those plans to tenants and asking employers what their unlocking plans are and how we can engage with them so that the common parts of buildings are as safe and usable as they can possibly be, so that people can get the most number of people back to work that they can. Have you had people coming into the buildings like Beauty House in Chippenham? Yeah, this is Beauty House behind me. Um, still available this particular suite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, most, most, um, most employers have a skeleton staff uh, in the building, but that, that presents problems all of their own. Some buildings we've mothballed and therefore we're not servicing the equipment like intruder alarms, fire alarms and things like that. And those will all have to be unlocked in, in the sense that the buildings will have to be made safe before people come back into the building as they'll need to be fully compliant. But the problem with skeleton staff is quite often um, the first aiders or the fire marshals aren't there because they've been furloughed or they're working from home. And therefore for an, an employers it's very very difficult because the, the workplaces are designed to be fully staffed and as they slim down to a skeleton staff and a large proportion home working we still have to work with them to make sure the buildings are safe for the people that who are, who are in the buildings. Yeah there's so many challenges thank you um, for giving us an overview Lindsay really appreciate it I'm going to move on now to Marcus Arangel from Homelets of Bath. Marcus good morning how are things with you? Morning. Good morning. How are um, things? Sorry, I've, I've just uh, just unmuted myself. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Anita. Um, really, just to echo what, a lot of what Alison and um, and uh, your and HPH 
and, and Lindsay have just been saying. Um, we've, um, we're have we really just trying to make sure that, uh, and we're really finding in the marketplace that things are just are ticking over. Um, we, um, we are just, um, sorry, one moment, I'm just trying to get some. No, so uh, yeah, sorry. We're just, we're just, um, we're just, we're just finding that in the marketplace in general, that we, that, that things are ticking over from a residential letting and, and property management perspective. Um, I think, as a lot of your speakers have been saying, in terms of transactions and uh, and, and transaction levels, in terms of doing business and how much business is being done, um, it's certainly uh, and markedly down. On, on average in terms of where we would be typically at this time of year, particularly from a property perspective going into the spring summer time, which is traditionally the, the busiest time of the year. Um, we're finding internally at Homelets at least that we're down anything from sort of 50 to, to 75% drop on transactions in terms of new lets um, and new business coming through to the market, as well as existing business in terms of um, tenancy renewals. Um, and tenants staying on. Um, we are finding that there are um, a there is an applicant pool in the market. There is a tenant pool in the market that um, that, that obviously includes key workers um, that are still looking to let property at this time. Um, so there are still leads and inquiries being fielded by our by our team at Homelets. Um, and then on the flip side, with regards to landlords. Um, understandably, landlords uh, like like many um, sort of consumer groups are looking for increased guidance in terms of um, what they should be doing or what they can be doing, um, and and they're looking for greater levels of support, obviously from their agent, um, and that's that's support that we've been giving them right the way through this pre-lockdown. Um, we we dispensed quite a lot of advice, and obviously right the way through until now, going forward. Um, for however ha however much longer, wh whatever the sort of next um, steps look like, uh, we'll obviously continue to do that. So, and part of that has been landlord switching to to, to to more managed services, whereby we can really come in and and, and get involved in the nitty gritty, uh, whether that be rent discussions or, or tenancy discussions or whatever it might be, just to provide that extra level of support that that they might need. So. Um, on the whole, it, it's I think as Alison and, and Lindsay have been saying, it's a it's a it's not such a bleak picture. Things are continuing, um, but there are clearly some some understandable concerns. And uh, and when you look at the general sort of macroeconomic picture um, being put out by government and Bank of England, obviously you know recession um, conversations and, and recession sort of warnings, it, 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 there are some concerns. Um, in terms of issues that we're coming up against in in the property sector in terms of on the ground in terms of residential and i think i'd probably speak for estate agents as well as lettings agents such as homelets um uh, clearly as, as i'm sure most are on this call um or, or, or most of the certainly most of the, of the country uh, remote working so working from home effective as at the end of march that was a very quick scale up in terms of um, building up the team so that we have the resources and the capability to effectively walk out of the office, go home, and just set up and start working. Uh, the Homelets team, in particular, actually, just a quick shout out to say that you know the entire Homelets team have been absolutely excellent in terms of um, being able to to just sort of walk out the door and get home and open the laptops and start working. So everyone's been remote, great. In, the sorry, remote working to, part is really important to get at things enabled. Yeah. Isn't it? We're going to move on to tech in a bit, but I need to talk about finance first. Thanks for your insight, yeah. Mark, because I just need to move us all on. No, a bit. It's so. Is yeah, sure. Right, spotlight on Dan from Southwest Business Finance. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we were going to have Yestin Lewis from IESIS um, this morning joining us on the property discussion, but he had to go and have a meeting about finance. So I thought that segued quite nicely into to you and talking with you and the importance of all of every, everybody as a business owner. Uh, 
in looking at their finances and where they are right now. How have things been for you? I know you've been very busy with the Sybil scheme. Yeah, I think um, there's two sides to our business. There's the property side, um, and then there's the trading business side for the cash flow sort of requirements, which you're right, C-bills has been, uh, and, and now the BBL have been where the spotlight's been. Most of what we're doing, to be honest, is more of a signposting type of exercise. I think to be, even though the banks have had a, a fairly big bash, and I, I generally feel they've done pretty well to um, manage the unprecedented uh, application levels that they've had. So a lot of it is just been signposting. Um, and a number of those clients have come back for either they're just not getting a response quick enough or they've been declined and then it's going back into the alternative market, which there's still a number of lenders out there that are helping uh, to try and support support these applications. It is a tricky market. It really is at the moment. Um, I think the, the biggest, I mean, actually, we were, on, we were on a call with the head of corporate from HSBC yesterday. And I think for the bank's point of view, their biggest concern is the consumer reaction to um, the lockdown or the coming out of the lockdown and how long that will take. And that will um, determine their sort of appetite coming, coming out the other side, which is, which is going to be quite interesting. Because I think with all these loans that have gone out, it'd be interesting to see in 12 months time where a lot of these businesses are and how they've dealt with um, the issues that, that have come up over the last couple of months. Are you dealing with a lot of businesses that are in serious trouble and if they don't get funding in the next few weeks, a few months, then they will go under? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lot. Um, there's, there's definitely a few. And, and I think, you know, when it first came out, Sybil's, it was this, um, this, this term viable with those, those businesses that could go for the finance. And I think it's just been understanding what that word viable means. So a lot of businesses have been finding out that they're not viable um, under the current um, uh, interpretation of it, but actually they are, and there's, there's alternative finance for them. Now it may not be through Sybils and therefore it's, it's guaranteed by the government and they may have to personally guarantee it, but you know, it's 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 been, it's available for, for them to get through this period and come out the other side, hopefully stronger. So, what would be your big piece of advice um, to businesses out there at the moment? Well, if anything, now it's, it's it's coming out of it. So, the biggest piece of advice is what we've seen in some of the Sybils things is that I think it's it's better now than it was say four weeks ago. But a lot of people were expecting say July or August that for their sales or their turnover to sort of come back probably quicker than it, it actually will. I think it's going to be a lot slower. So it's it's pushing your cash flow out and sensitize your cash flow probably more than you would normally do. And that will that will give you a realistic um debt requirement and not hopefully put you in trouble six or seven months down the line. So it's just been really, really cautious on your forecasting. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to move on to Ian Lloyd from Milstead Langdon. Ian um, is an accountant and, and business advisor and has been working hard with lots of businesses during the crisis. Ian, how are things with your clients? Yeah, as Dan was saying there, really, um, <clears throat> we've been flat out since the 23rd of March talking to clients, um, you know, <clears throat> being alongside them, being the sort of non-exec directors to some extent. But uh, Cash flow has been critical, doing lots of C-bills, uh, uh, bounce backs, uh, talking to HMRC, deferment schemes, a lot of MI, a lot of uh, management reporting still being needed. And in fact, year-end accounts and tax returns are being <clears throat> uh, forthcoming very quickly at the moment. If you want to know where they stand. Um, I think you mentioned to uh, Dan there about um, businesses not doing so well. Yeah, our, our insolvency intervention teams are pretty flat out at the moment talking to people about their sort of liabilities, personal um, positions, um, and that's the worry I think saying that when we come out the other side or the next four to six weeks, um, particularly hospitality and perhaps charity sectors as well have struggled really uh, badly. I'm sure Les will comment later, but um, so yeah, just trying to be supportive. Um, we've got some furlough staff coming back, which is good for us. I mean, we're, we're flat out on the tools, really. Um, but I mean, the furloughing scheme has been fantastic, I think. But if anybody's been in, involved with the process and the navigation of the portal, 
it's not at all easy to navigate or even to get the claims through. Um, we've doubled the size of our payroll teams to try and help clients. Um, but um, I'm particularly impressed with clients that have innovated and diversified. Um, I think clients are doing pretty well, thinking on their feet, trying to get cash coming in. Um, but I think the, um, the confidence levels just needs to rise. Yeah. All struggling that. Well, thank you, Ian. I'm just going to move on now to Paul Holmes from PCH Business Support. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. You've been working with lots of businesses throughout the Southwest. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the concerns that they've been having, both financially, and you've worked with a lot of businesses in some ways similar to Ian. He works with a lot of manufacturing firms, and I know that's your kind of background. How are, how are things for, for businesses that you're talking with? Um, it's a mixed bag. Um, so I'm, I'm working with businesses all across um, Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, down into sort of Bath and Somerset, and I'm seeing everything from absolute panic right through to people who are seriously investing and planning for sort of um, massive investment for the future and everything in between. Um, lots of businesses not falling into the camp that they can get the, um, the direct support from the government. It's those people that I'm tending to see lots of um, questions from in terms of what can I do. Um, like Ian, um, those companies who are being progressive, who are adapting their products, who are looking at their businesses, working on their business, um, being really clear about messaging to their customers, their clients, um, raising their profile, really getting clear about their messaging in terms of um, who they are, what they're doing, are the ones that are being most proactive. And I think the ones will come out of this the strongest. Um, I am seeing people who are sort of sitting with their head in their hands, um, who just need someone to sit down and sort of step by step, let's look practically at what you're doing with the business. Let's look at your costs, let's look at your cash flow, let's look at um, how your um, customers are responding, how have things changed, what can you adapt, what can you do in the, in the short term? Um, so it really is a, a, a mixed bag. But it's that practical support, I think, that businesses need at the moment, isn't it? To actually walk them through and a little bit of hand-holding rather than panicking. Yeah, a lot of it is. And there are lots of practical things that you can do in the business. Um, there is lots of support out there. There are lots of organisations that are providing some free support. And all the organisations I with, I work with um, are delivering that free of service at the point of use, which is fantastic. But it's... Some of it is signposted, but what they really need is somebody to actually just hold their hands and sit down and say, okay, does the business actually work? Let's look at the business model. How can you adapt it? And I've had some great examples of um, a business um, a couple of weeks ago, wedding company, lost everything for the entire summer. Everything's gone. And what we've been able to do is to create a service for them, for clients to rebook later on in the year. And because they work very close with lots and lots of venues, they've been able to identify already gaps in um, different, sort of, might be a different day of the week, but effectively recreating their wedding at the point later in the, in the, in the summer or later in the, in the autumn. Um, and actually, the way that they've done this, because it's now an online version, they can see a lot more clients and in theory will probably double their turnover by working in a completely different way. And this will become their model going forward. I've seen lots of examples of businesses doing exactly that, being really careful and, and thinking about the way the business should work in reality and probably should have been working anyway. So it's a great time to reflect and work on the business. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm now going to put the spotlight on Ali James from Cumberwell Park in Bradford on Avon. Um, it's a golf club. It's a wedding venue. It's a place that we host our business meetings on a regular basis normally. Ali, how's business for you? I think it's changed hugely in the last couple of days with the, with the government announcement. See, there's two main avenues to, to come by where we've got the hospitality side of things, the golf side of things, and uh, as many of you know, the hospitality side of things has been completely decimated over the last couple of months. Um, weddings cancelled, events cancelled, celebrations cancelled, which has, has not only been difficult for us, but devastating for, for those individual clients who've, who've put so much time and effort into arranging celebrations and weddings. Um, but again, they are managing to rebook for dates uh, next year and, and looking at, at potential other options. Um, our hospitality staff are all furloughed at present, so we wait for any sort of announcement on the 
furlough scheme because uh, we don't we don't see the event side of the business getting going for for quite a considerable period of time yet. We think possibly the government have said maybe it will open some form of bar based um, option at the beginning of July, but we'll we'll have to see um, how that develops. Um, so so yeah, hospitality is is uh, it's just. It's just nothing at the moment in terms of what we're doing, but the golf, as you can imagine, the announcement on Sunday night that golf clubs can reopen has, has gone some uh, mental, really. Uh, we are planning to reopen on Wednesday morning alongside the guidelines that we've received from the government and from um, the other bodies of golf. Uh, our members have been phoning this morning, the phone is crazy, people booking, and I think it's a great opportunity for people to get back to, to other forms of exercise. There are huge, huge restrictions as to what people can do. They can only play with people from their household or one other person, so it's a matter of two people. Um, and we've spent a lot of time as a management board making sure it is safe for, for our people, for our staff, and for our members because when they return, it's vitally important that we're going to have to drum in that much about um, good hygiene and things like that so we can't hear you that well um Ali I don't know why um but it sounds like it's a good opportunity if you've not tried golf before speak to Ali and see if you can try out Cumberwell Park uh we're going to move on to tech now um and talk about remote working I've put the spotlight on Chris Goff from Mintivo Chris I guess you've moved on a little bit from the frantic setups that you would have been doing a few weeks ago what how are things changed now yeah, and, and to be honest, we haven't. It wasn't too manic for us. Um, most of our customers have kind of been on a journey forward thinking, uh, last recovery plan in place, kind of set up to work remotely already. So we, we definitely had a few um, very early on just to configure anything, but um, it could have been a lot worse. Luckily, the businesses we work with uh, kind of invested in technology in advance, um, and so uh, fairly. Uh, ready to work from home. Um, what we're seeing now is it's more around uh, collaboration and best use of the technology and using the tools that are in place and available to uh, get to replicate that experience in person, the situations around that you normally get in the office. I'm not sure why, but the quality of the video seems to have gone to some degree. Is everyone having issues? If you um, could put a little note in the chat that would be great. I'm going to move on to Nathan Baranowski. Nathan, good morning. Can you tell us a little bit of work about the work that you've been doing in terms of digital transformation for businesses? Yeah, our focus at the moment is very much on helping uh, organisations to uh, enable uh, So, in the main kind of global position, it was a service based uh, physical service offering to a virtual one, uh, web. Uh, and other means. So we're doing that for uh, a number of charities. Um, so uh, Five Five Charity, who uh, typically would provide the uh, coaching services uh, in uh, and acceleration delivery of that service now, and also uh, for a charity in Wales. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're supporting a mental health charity who had some ideas about how they'd like to step forward, and we're accelerating those activities at the moment to help them to provide those services as quickly as possible for free digital. So where one might have done for a traditional training, uh, we're looking to, to offer it uh, in a better way. Teams aren't breaking up as well, which is uh, I think maybe on the Zoom side. Um, so <laughs> the joy of technology and transformation. So frustrating and we're relying on these apps so much to kind of get us through. Um, one of the questions I have for Ojo and for everyone in the room is what are your challenges in terms of tech? Do you need booking engines uh, to help you return to work? Do you need um, some kind of facility um, to ensure that staff are on a staff rota system? Some of the stuff that we're hearing is that the people on a rota must stay on the same rota. Um, so tech and its part in that is important. What systems are you using? And how are you trying to 
innovate your company online and digitize it more to, to make the most of opportunities. I know that Nathan and Ojo are doing um, a surgery as such, aren't you, to, to, to help people? I'll attempt to respond, uh, but if not, I'll, I'll type it in the box if it can't be heard. Um, so, yes, we're offering uh, support services to any business uh, and for charities to help them understand how to use digital methods to support their needs and transform. I think the real important bit here is to, to adapt and to rethink. So, rather than saying, oh, I need to do what I was doing digitally, and do the same, actually think about how digital will change the way that offer can be in place. Or how that expands your opportunity to go elsewhere. I think uh, is a great example of how you can adapt to that and how you can support uh, in, in different ways in order to do what you need to do. Also, about the technology that's right in front of you, maybe using Microsoft products, things like Office 5, there is a ton of tools inside there that will help you in order to support that. Brilliant. Thanks, Nathan. We will share everybody's details at the end of this. So if you didn't catch everything, um, that you've got people's details, you've got the, the contact details and you've got the information of the different things that they're sharing as well. Um, I'm going to move on now to Fiona Scott, who I think, thanks to, to Joe from Action Coach, has, um, oh no, she's still there. A lot of people have um, turned their video off to try and see if we can get the sound a little bit better. And we're going to move on to business comms and how we can kind of start getting things right in terms of um, our messaging and how we, we need to stay visible at the moment. Fiona, tell us a little bit about how businesses can, can keep themselves out there. Hi, everyone. Uh, have a little wave or thumbs up or anything. If you can hear me okay. No time to see. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, gosh, it has been... Um, just sit uh, two months of complete variety in terms of comms. I've been trying in my business to encourage everyone to um, adopt a positive comms strategy. So um, very much being positive, even when you don't feel positive, um, and to be out there as much as possible. Even if your business is affected now, even if you've got to do it yourself, get some training. I've been on a bit myself at quite a cost. Um, and be someone who's very visible because what's really surprised me is how hand holding people have needed. Um, the other thing I've noticed is some business owners who are previously very visible um, and their businesses where a majority of their staff have gone into furlough have kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. It's almost like they've hunkered down and they're uh, licking their wounds at this time. I personally believe that's a huge mistake. If you were a person who was very out there prior to lockdown, then you lose that for two or three months, depending on when your business comes back on stream um, in any real way. You're going you're gonna to have a long mountain to climb in terms of PR. The more you're consistent throughout this time, the easier it's going to be afterwards. And also, stories for the media that normally wouldn't be a story are a story now. So, you know, if you're one of the first golf clubs to get back on track, why aren't you telling the local media that and, and showing them a nice picture? Garden centres, all of these businesses that are going to come on stream. Normally, I just opened up for business would not be a media story, but we're in a different situation now. And the media is looking for hopeful stories um, in their own communities to get those stories out there. Uh, the other thing I'd really say is use video. If you've never used it before, now is the time to get used to it. Blimey, even I'm doing a YouTube channel at home. So, um, you know, use video as much as you can and keep telling stories. Use your social media to evidence what your business is doing um, and show all those different services and make a little plan. Um, these are really important times to work on the business rather than in the business. If you've been in a real hamster wheel, even if you're really worried now, work on the businesses and marketing and PR, sort of my space and the space of others here, Anita, Natalie, um, now is the time to really work on that stuff and I really think I've been doing it the last few years. Um, the other thing I really want to say is you're going to know as business owners that if you've done things that aren't quite so great, that are quite negative at this time, um, you're going to have a much harder job with PR. I think this situation is going to be that um, reputational reckoning one follows me when I've been saying this over time. So if you haven't been paying your suppliers or you haven't treated your customers well, 
or any of these things and you're being honest up front, you're going to pay a price for that after this. So um, crisis management is something people have to think about, um, especially I think when it comes to how you deal with staff as lockdown is lifted. Um, staff, when they've got and sort of it disempowered, will often go to the media to express their words and concerns. And the media will always take the song the little guy. So crisis management in terms of comms, especially for businesses if they're bigger ones, or if you're very customer focused, you really need to be thinking about that now and preparing for it. Um, really, those are just a few observations that I hope are helpful to you um, as we will move through this together. That's brilliant. Thanks, Fee. I'm going to just um, put the spotlight on Gary Squire now from Creatrix PR in Bath. Would you agree with Fiona? Are there any extra bits that you could add to, to that, Gary? Yeah, I think morning, Anise. Morning, everybody. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of what Fiona said there actually ring true with what we're finding as well. I think ultimately, though, people need to realise that, you know, your audience still does want to hear from you. And I think that's very key. I think a, lot, a lot of people, it's almost like people have contracted within themselves. Um, and I think obviously it offers, it offers a huge opportunity. Um, so I think re recognize that, you know, your audience still wants to hear from you. Journalists still need stories. And, and going forward, I think, you know, obviously once we get uh, get further into this, um, I'm gonna get, there will be sort of a sort of a COVID uh, ceiling which people will reach in terms of they want to hear something else they want to hear things other than about COVID so um, it's still an opportunity and I will actually um, echo what Fiona said there just be helpful you know if and look, try and find out uh, journalists and, 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 and media types who aren't actually writing about COVID so I think it's very very important as well to look at your audience um, how's coronavirus affecting them have their priorities changed um, how has coronavirus affected my product or service um, and what's the best way to communicate to your audience so you know you can then obviously start, start tailoring content around that um, I think probably be ready to react very quickly as well take a hold of opportunity as uh, you get to move sharply there um, I think another thing as well is uh, the other thing as well is probably as some businesses have found out um, promote content or promote stories empathetically as I would probably my one number one thing I'd say there's already been a few cases where people uh, brands businesses have been accused of almost sort of trying to use it as an you know a coronavirus as a, as, as a as an opportunity so I think um, just be really careful with the content you're pushing there because obviously um, people are very sensitive about everything at the moment and probably it's it, there's a heightened sense of sensitivity at the moment. So be very careful what you're putting out on social media and be very careful sort of around the content that you're pushing out. But I think ultimately, you know, as I said, people still want to hear from you. So, you know, don't, don't retract into a shell um, and don't switch everything off. Um, you know, the only way we will get through this is by, is by constantly talking as well, I think. So I think there's huge opportunities out there, but um, yeah, but maybe just handle it a little bit more sensitively than uh, maybe you would have before. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> talking about social media, we'll move on to Natalie from Naturally Social. Natalie, you've been really active on social throughout the crisis. Yeah, definitely, because, um, you know, what we taken that stance as kind of Gary and Fiona were saying is you know be helpful to our audience we needed to, everybody to know that we were still here and actually we were sensitive to this time and we wanted to give back to that business community particularly small businesses who um, haven't had time to learn or understand social media but where social media is our really key opportunity for you to communicate communicate to your customers you need to understand how to use it so We've been giving, uh, holding free webinars, uh, free videos, business shout outs on Fridays to really give some extra innovation to the business community and upskill them whilst they have the time, as other people have said, to work on their business and not in it for a change. <coughs> um, one of the things I would also echo what, what Gary Vernon was saying is that I've either seen two things. People have stopped communicating full stop and put their head in their hands or um, you know, they've been innovative and they've been willing to kind of communicate with their audience. And that's really key. I think, as Fee said, you're gonna have a massive job if you've just stopped talking to your audience for the last three months. You've got a massive hill to climb. The key 
is that you need to be consistent now, timely, authentic. Explain to your customers how you're responding, changing, reacting, and tell them what they can expect when your doors do open, how they expect to, inter expect to interact with you and, and how they can expect to use your service. Um, and I'm sure Alison will probably have some stuff to say around nerves around selling during this time. But, you know, if you do it the right way and it's authentic and it's relevant, the selling right now is absolutely fine. Um, but don't jump on the kind of coronavirus bandwagon on social media just to get content out there. Thank you. I think one of the questions actually that was sent in to me before the event was from Hilary Grist from Coombe Grove and her questions were around what key communication should they be, uh, should businesses be sending out to their customers, how often, so the, the kind of answer is the consistency that you were saying. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. you know each channel will have a different kind of level in terms of how much you need to put on, where and when, but showing up regularly is really key. And, you know, taking people on a journey with you that shows them what you're doing now, where you were before, how you're changing, what can people expect and being really honest about it. You know, the, the kind of idea with fitness and exercise, and we have a couple of golf clients as well, where you know, the decisions and, and the rules and advice have changed literally in 24 to 48 hours. But you need to be prepared with messaging to go out ASAP and take them and be honest and take them on that journey. Video is a, an amazing way to really keep that confidence with your customers and to get the message out in a, a kind of a way that's better for algorithms anyway, but it's more engaging too. Um, I've seen loads more video content over the last couple of months, which is fantastic. We've actually put a, an ebook together, a free ebook to help people understand how they can now integrate video into their social media. So if anyone wants that, um, just pop me a, an email, um, info at naturallysocial.co.uk and we can send that over. Thank you. One thing we're doing at the Business Exchange is sharing video messages on our website for just £10 and they can be hosted there all the time and we can update the messages whenever you like if you've got new videos coming out. I wanted to just mention before we kind of wrap up because I'm aware that the clock is ticking now, but thanks for that Natalie, um, is... Um, the role of well-being in this. Um, I think Madeline from um, the Soul Spa in Bath was going to be in the room, but I've looked for her and I can't find her now. Um, and they've been doing a lot of work with online, um, doing free meditation sessions and, and then a, a reduced pay for service where some money is going to the charity Mind. Um, I've just upgraded to a panellist, Jan de Jong from People Business Psychology. Um, if, ja if Jan can just give us a few tips on how to, to stay positive um, at, the, at the moment. You didn't Hi, think I was going to do this. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think a lot of it has been said already. I think um, we also have to perhaps to begin with acknowledge that it's difficult times i mean uh, you know we talk about the great depression of was it 1939 or something and this is probably worse and you know we need to acknowledge that it's diff very difficult times and you know people are dying <laughs> and businesses are you know down at their knees if that's english uh, so it is very difficult and that's the first thing that i do for myself to acknowledge that it's very very hard and i do sometimes feel uh, tearful or emotional and you know i might sometimes be more irritable than other times and um feel more self-conscious than i would normally do so that's the first phase i think or first step then I try to quickly move on to what you've said, Anita, that chimes with me, is adaptability. I mean, look at me. I'm sitting here, here in my office and I, I feel I've got a lot more time than I used to have to clear up my, my desk, even if I haven't done it yet, <laughs> and uh, think about, uh, you know, content to be, to be put out there or people I should contact that I haven't done for a long time or creating new tools. Um, rekindling connections that have been uh, forgotten about so there's a lot that's, that we can do ourselves to um, to make things more um, or to, to gain it gain a little bit more control I would say apart from that it's it's, it's very basic things like uh, 
trying to not go to, from, if I speak about myself, <laughs> reminding myself to go to bed on time and getting up early in the morning rather than thinking, oh, I can lie in for another half an hour. You know, your whole, my whole schedule would easily go, go to pot if I didn't um, um, push myself to keep some sort of schedule. Yeah. Apart from that is, you know, living, living, living healthily, drinking lots of water, eating well. Uh, I follow Sean Swift's uh, amazing photographs <clears throat> of her food that uh, luckily I don't make myself, but the people around me make. It's, 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 it's fantastic. What I'm saying is you need to try and look after yourself and eat well. And even that is, is, is a good step towards, um, you know, well-being, mental well-being, physical well-being. Thank you. I just I, I thought it'd be a good um, opportunity for you to say a few words there and, and touch on something that we haven't yet. And so thanks for that. I'm now going to introduce Les Redwood from the CAB in Bath now, or Citizens Advice Bureau now, talking about people in need and, and troubles. Les, you've had so many calls during the crisis. Yes, we have, Anita. Um, and firstly, can I also just say, I think on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for putting this on. Uh, and for all the other work that you are doing with the Business Exchange and Sean and the rest of the team, I think we all really appreciate it. So thank you for all you're doing. I know it's a real challenge for all of us at the moment, but we do really appreciate it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Picking up on what you're saying, really, um, that, you know, we had a huge surge specifically with Citizens Advice, um, specifically really around the universal credit side of things. Um, we went from a situation where there were sort of normally about 30,000 um, national applicants being handled by the um, universal credit system uh, to up to now 1.75 million people involved with that uh, with that uh, that system. Um, but as as we've sort of said, I mean, you know, it, it, it is now completely changed our way of working, and and also, um, you know, it, it's changed the, also the type of client that we specifically get uh, within Citizens Advice as well. And just coming to your point of adaptability. Um, and has been repeated by you know a lot of other uh, panelists today. Um, yes, this is really a time to be adaptable. Um, and you know specifically at Citizens Advice, we've had to completely rewire our operation. We removed five front-facing services. Uh, we increased our home working as we've all done, um, but we've also working now remotely on the phones. Um, so advice is still out there. We've also um, brought a web form onto our onto our website. Uh, so that now people can leave us email inquiries um, and also that they can, uh, obviously there's an increased phone service. Uh, but the biggest point I wanted to make, um, and uh, we've talked about this before, um, Anita, is about partnerships. Uh, because now partnerships are absolutely crucial with either in, within your industry or within sectors working together. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, we've been able to pull together a very strong strategic partnership across Baines um, working with Baines Council, uh, the 3SG, uh, third sector group, Baines 3SG, and also with Virgin Care. Um, and fairly quickly after the lockdown, we were able to uh, bring about 10 organisations together in a compassionate community hub, um, which is now, I've uh, got a, a phone number attached to it, if you Google compassionate community hub, um, there are, there's a council partnership there, there's a, there's a healthcare and social care partnership there, there are charities there such as Earth's DHI um, and Bath Mind. Uh, there's a whole network there for the um, residents of Baines to use. Uh, you phone the 0300 number and then the team will triage you out to the 10 organisations that are involved to help and support. Now all of that has been pulled together um, by partnership working and by adaptability um, and everybody looking at the challenges that they face and um, working together as a team to firstly obviously help the residents and uh, residents and uh, uh, patients and and clients uh, across across uh, Baines as itself, uh, but also uh, to help ensure the sustainability of those organisations involved. And as uh, Fiona said, and, and and some of the marketing and PR side have said, is to tell your story in, in a better way and use that adaptability to really illustrate um, you know, the extra benefits um, that we're bringing to the community and the support we're bringing to the community. So it's just taking the situation and being adaptable and, um, and supporting and, and delivering a better solution and therefore um, supporting your own sustainability and longevity um, as well. 
Thank you, Les. I think there's so many of us are there on hand to help. If you've got any particular offers um, of help or advice, if you're doing any clinics like Ojo are doing to help, do take the support, do take the advice. A lot of people don't expect to sail off the back of it. And they, they really genuinely want to help people right now. And there's uh, lots of ways out there that if so if you wanted to work with me for example in the business exchange no you might not be able to afford a half page may you might not be able to afford a full page but what could i find for you um that would work in terms of messaging to to promote offers that you've got out there i think all of us are open to conversations so just talk to people um and come up with ideas and share them and just engage with the local community. I think we are very much here to help. Um, before we end, I'm aware that we've run over and apologies for that. I've got two questions that have come through. One question that's come through, which is uh, from Joe Rolleston, an action coach. One of the challenges um, our clients are facing is no school and many rely on grandparents for childcare during the holidays. Uh, question for Joe Kangas HR, if Joe's still in the room, she is, um, a perspective on those unable to return to, to work due to, to childcare. Um, let me just, oh, can I unmute? Joe, are you still there? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> sorry. So what would your advice be in terms of childcare? I think it's looking at whether or not homeworking can be accommodated um, and being a bit sort of thinking out of the box and being flexible around it. But he's also bearing in mind that even if people can work from home, if they've got very young children, what's realistically, are they going to get any work done? So thinking about you know, being flexible with hours, so can they do some work in the evenings when maybe their other half is at home? Um, but if it genuinely cannot be accommodated, then looking at periods of unpaid leave, um, using up some holiday, um, if furlough scheme's still running, looking at that as a possibility. But I think it's trying to be as flexible as possible. Um, you know, there is a risk that running into discrimination issue because most going to be mainly females that are going to struggle with home working so I think employers do need to be quite cautious about it yeah thank you Joe. I've got another question and I'll pop the spotlight on Kerry for this one can an employee sue an employer if they become ill with COVID-19 at work in spite of all necessary steps being taken that's a really tricky <laughs> question there really isn't a very straight answer I mean the starting point for all employers, obviously, is to remember their, their obligations under health and safety legislation. Um, I won't try and go into the complexities of causation as to where, when and how somebody might think, believe or know they caught the virus. But quite clearly, um, that duty of care, which is there anyway, is going to underline all of the measures that you take when people are coming back to the workplace. So all of the safe practices, following the government guidelines, carrying out your risk assessments, making sure you've got them in writing, engaging employees and health and safety reps in those risk assessments. Those are all the precautionary measures that you can take. Um, I mean, in the same way as if you had an unsafe workplace and somebody tripped over an uncovered hole in the middle of your car park and broke their leg, they might bring a personal injury claim against you. It's exactly the same legislation that surrounds it i suppose but health and safety executive government guidelines carrying out risk assessments those are really the key things that you must do brilliant thank you um and moving on nicely from that actually i promised um alistair resnicki that i would talk about his initiative which is uh, mrs gel and friends off the back of his grandmother dying a few years ago now from mrsa which is another superbug um uh, Alistair created these posters and characters which are Mrs Jell and Friends and he's got um, a big um, selection of posters that people can use free of charge and I think he's making some little videos and things as well because uh, he is a, a videographer um, in his normal life so if people want to share I think um, that Alistair's going to share a link with everyone regarding that so um, please do use the free resources on that are available so so uh, that's that i'm gonna end now um with a really positive note because i know alison edgar 
um, who's the entrepreneur's godmother, um, will all make us feel really positive about our day. Well, I really hope that I'll make you positive <laughs> about your day. Um, so thank you so much. I've been listening to everyone's opinions and, and it's been really interesting. Um, this might not make some people's day because a lot of people don't actually like sales. For years, a lot of businesses have been sitting in complacency. Oh, they don't have to sell because they get everything by recommendation and all comes through their marketing and it's insensitive. You know, we shouldn't be selling at the moment. Actually, at the moment, I, in my opinion, it's a bit like survival of the fittest and sales is one of the key elements. I mean, I get asked all the time, so, you know, you know, what's the secret of running a successful business? Well, to me, it's a bit like being on a diet, right? So if you're on a diet, you've got to eat less and exercise more. I know there's so many different nuances to business, but ultimately you need to sell more, spend less and make profit. So to me, the government have really helped us that, you know, there's some great schemes out there. You look at the bounce back loans. I mean, I applied for one yesterday. I don't intend to use it, but I'm going to put it in my little pot just in case. Um, and I think coming back to it's interesting. I was listening to um, Richard from Elm Workspace and he was saying, oh, I'm not quite sure if it's the right time or, you know, I don't want to be insensitive. To me, the mission statement of everything I teach is when it's delivered correctly, sales and customer service is exactly the same thing. So no matter what your product or what your service, if you can help someone, it's actually your duty to reach out to them and not buy my product, buy my product. And also the other thing which is really driving me bananas at the moment is so many knowledge experts, so many coaches, so many people in the service industry are giving away all their stuff for free because they think they're being helpful, but that's not sustaining their business. So really you have to look at what you're charging for your services. So we've been a wee bit of a salmon. We've kind of gone uphill when everybody was doing free webinars. We did a um, productivity, positivity, and proactivity. And we charged £10 a ticket, £12.50 a ticket. And we had 54 people attend. So, you know, we're not, unless you are running a charity or a social enterprise, but if you're running a business, you've got to really look at that. So how do you stay in a positive mind frame to really help bring it up for the day? So um, how I teach people is, if you wake up in the morning and you think like, take that. So you wake up in the morning and you think today, this could be the greatest day of our life. And you know, there's somebody in the UK who's won 58 million in the Euro lottery. So if you think like that, when you get up and feeding into Jan's point, you know, you wouldn't, if you're running a business and you're taking it seriously, you'd be setting your alarm, you'd be getting up, you'd be following your routine, you know, feeding into what Fiona said, you know, you've got to get the good news stories out, get your profile out there, you know, everywhere you'll see me all over LinkedIn, all over Facebook, my brand is everywhere because coming out the other side, I want to be the go-to person. So if you think it's going to be the greatest day, what will happen is you feel better and then it'll lead into your behaviors. So when you are picking up the phone to talk to people, you'll be in a positive mindset, you'll feed that across to them, and then you know what? You will feel it's the greatest day. So it's the CBT circle, but you've got to start off thinking like your Gary Barlow. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. Well, what we'll do is um, share all of the info, any offers our panellists have, and anybody else in the room uh, at the end of the session, I'll send a note out and go through all of the chat notes and everything and make sure that we haven't missed anything. We're currently producing our June, July edition for Swindon and Wiltshire and our summer bath edition. They will be out for mid-June. Um, we, we have increased our database during this time where um, we may have been sending magazines in, in, in normal circumstances to places like hotels. We've actually got a database of named individuals um, and of directors and business owners that want to receive our magazines in their places um, at, at home as well. And we've been doing that throughout as well as their places of work. We've been doing that um, over the last six weeks or so. So um, the business exchange is very much still in business and we've got opportunities from £10. So do talk to either myself or Sean, um, sign up to our newsletters via our home pages and follow us on Twitter at TBE Bath and at TBESW. 
and the hashtag TBE support. So I'll wrap it up for now. I want to say thank you to all of our panellists. I'm sorry that there was a bit of a zoomy sound um, issue, um, but I'll make sure that any anything that people try to communicate is communicated after this session. But um, have positive days. Thank you all. Take care. And I will hopefully see you all in person very soon. Thank Bye you. everyone. Bye people. Bye everybody. Bye.